Good morning. Bless us up at each one of you, brothers and sisters, friends and visitors. Unity in Christ. Oh boy. This is a really tough subject. And uh, I wish that reality and unity to be one word, the same. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not. So today in the morning, I want to... Um, dig in this uh, subject. We are 7.2 billion population in this world and there are no two DNA samples in the same like manner. People are different. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I want to say that Jesus Christ, sorry, Jesus Christ is the most, uh, did I Okay, Jesus Christ was the most controversial person in the world because when we talk about Jesus, we talk about love, we talk about unity, we talk about peace. And in, in fact, I want to say, brothers and sisters and young people, that unity in Christ and peace and forgiveness basically are the same thing, the same experience, the same substance. However, one statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, Reform, uh, Review and Herald, uh, says that think of Jesus. How much he was said against him. How he was despised and hated. So, tell me, was Jesus a very controverted person? A person that people fought against? Jesus was a person that really was an act of controversy for many, many people. In fact, I want to say that... Um, uh, there was, um, there was um, a debate between a, a great atheist, I don't know exactly if you heard about Birmingham in, in the state of Alabama. Uh, it was about the, um, Christopher Hatches, it's an atheist, philosopher, it's a literal critic. Uh, and uh, John Lennox, which is the philosophy, science and ma mathematics professor. So they met to together and guess what, the debate, the guy said there is no God, there is no love, there is nothing, uh, the atheist. And uh, John Lennox, the, he's a Christian Bible believer, he was defending that there is an awesome God, uh, awesome Christ, awesome Savior. So it is interesting when they start to collide with arguments against each other, they used the same argument of the Lord Jesus Christ. I come to give you peace. So the mathematic professor, John Lennox, says, look, let me read you a Bible verse, that there is a God in heaven. So he used argument number one, John chapter four, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world give it to you, give I unto you. So this was the argument of the Christian. Bible believer. The argument of the atheist is the following. Matthew chapter 10 verse 34. How can you talk about Jesus that he came to bring peace and harmony and unity in the world when the same Jesus of yours says something else. Think not that I came to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Now tell me, is Jesus a very controverted, very dis discussed, disputed uh, personality, character in the history of the world. Yes or no? So one comes with the argument, peace I will give unto you, peace I will give unto you, not as the world give it to you. And the other one says, no, think not, I came to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword is the same Jesus. Now, can Jesus contradict the, uh, uh, with himself? Is Jesus talking in different language, the same language, different language? He means something else. Now, I would like to tell you, brothers and sisters, when we talk about uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 45, clarifies the language, multiple language of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then open here, uh, he dare understanding that they might understand the scriptures. In fact, uh, the, the statement should uh, sound like, then he opened their what? their mind that they might understand the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, we have zero chances to become good Christians, to become Christians like him, if he does not open our mind to understand the scriptures. Is that true? I mean, if I approach the scriptures with an atheistic or cynical or skeptical attitude, I will not understand much of that. I will find a lot of controversy, a lot of contradictions in the scripture, if Jesus himself does not open my mind towards the reflection of the truth in the Bible. So, then he 
who is Jesus? Uh, do you remember in our uh, opening um, uh, lecture when we talk about love, plan of salvation, in the first lecture I said that let's say God equals love. Do you remember that? And we try to make an effort, we go home and wherever we find the word God, we replace the word God with love. Did we try to do that? How many have made that effort? Today, however, I would like to make another, another replacement. Wherever you find the word Jesus, you put the word love. Make sense? Yes or no? So now, then love opened their mind that they may understand the scriptures. Love, God, Jesus, opens our minds that we may understand the scriptures. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth to you. And then one of the statements, uh, Jesus says, listen, there is a peace of the world and there is my peace that comes from my heart, comes from my truth. Uh, the spirit of prophecy says, whoever consent to renounce sin and to open his heart to the love of Christ becomes a partaker of this heavenly peace. Now, peace of the world does not come that way. But here you have a statement. Renounce of what, everybody? Of sin. If we don't renounce of sin, if they do not have this intention to uh, renounce sin and open our hearts to the love of Christ, we cannot become the partakers of his peace and love. Uh, now, I want to stop here and um, would like to talk face to face. Brothers and sisters, unity. I believe that unity is a, a word in uh, very much in fashion in the world. Um, politicians are dreaming of uh, global unity. They want to create a, a new world government. You know, they, they, they talk about globalization and one um, bank of, uh, of, of, of all the world, of uh, religions and uh, of the governments. Uh, this is the ideal of politicians. They want unity. If you can't talk to the leaders of religion, they want unity too. You know, they have ecumenical movement, despise. Just put the Bible aside and let's in the name of the Lord unite, in the name of the Lord unite uh, each other. So there is a passion from the politician side about unity. There is a passion from the leaders. Uh, of religion to unite. In even countries, brothers and sisters, societies dream of the time when the, the borders will be open and all the nations will be one nation. Have you ever heard about this concept? You know, people believe that in, there will be a time in the history, in the future of this world, that the borders will be open and all the nations will become one nation. No borders, we will be united all uh, together. Now, humanly speaking, we don't need to make efforts to be united. Brothers and sisters, this is a big bingo. We are united in sin. We don't need to make efforts to be united, brothers and sisters, all of us together here. We are united in sin, unless we are converted. Is that true? Yes or no? So we are united in sin, and we are united, like uh, I, mean, I, can, I can give a, even an, an example. Uh, um, we are united in sin, we are united in loving sin. Sinner, we, our human nature, loves sin. Yeah, enjoys sin. Unless we are converted. So we don't need to make an effort to be united today. That's why in order to be united with Christ, Christ, we cannot be united with Christ and with sin. So the, 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 the power of sin must be broken down. We must break off sin in order to experience to be united with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Lord in, in that respect. Human nature since Adam has sold us as slaves. He, he, Adam actually sold himself in slavery, yes? And Adam sold us. So when I am born, brothers and sisters, I am born with a passion for sin. Do you agree with that? I think that there's no time for hypocrisy here. We are born in sin and we have passion. We developed along the years passion for sin. You know, jealousy, envy, advertising, uh, bad stuff, enjoying when somebody does bad things, you know, we want to see the talk of the town. This is us. We are sinners. And sin is what, is what keeps us united unless we get converted to Christ. That's the, the reality. Now, not as the world give it. How does the world give peace or unity to 
the people. This is a fundamental difference between us, the Christians, and the world. Man has fallen, God's image in his defense. By disobedience, he's deprived in inclination and weakened in power, unable apparently to look forward to anything but tribulation and wrath. Since we fall in sin, we have no futuristic, we don't have hope for future. This is what the spirit of prophecy says. However, uh, the first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3 says that the world is seeking peace without Christ. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as the travail upon woman with child, and they shall not escape. So the world is looking for what? For peace and unity. Then Look at uh, statements from the spirit of prophecy now. Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, uh, with those who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith of Jesus. In their enmity against the people of God, they show themselves guilty of the choice of Barabbas instead of Christ. So you want a piece of the world, we choose Barabbas. You want a piece of, of, of God, we choose Christ. These have one mind. So the world has how many minds? The world has one mind. There will be a universal bound of union. You see, the world speaks about union. The spirit of prophecy knew that 7.2 billion people in this world will unite. So sin, it's a very much power to unite, to keep people together. So that's why we don't need to, meet, uh, we don't need to make uh, efforts to, to keep us united. As long as we are living in sin, all together are united, brothers and sisters. These uh, have uh, one mind, there will be a universal bond of union and great harmony, a confederacy of Satan forces, and shall give their power and strength to the beast. Now, Reformation Herald says, men may seek to strengthen their forces by confederating together, meaning unity, suppose strong societies who carry out the plans they have formed. They may lift up their souls in pride and self-sufficiency, but the one mighty in council does not plan with them. God does not plan with the unity of the world, brothers and sisters. And in one side is unity of the world, in the other side is the unity of the people of God. So now, uh, when we talk about Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 32, says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, what? Good things are going from uh, nation to nation? Thus said the, world, the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. So what unites the world today? The good or the evil? The evil. Now, and the great werewolf shall be raised from the coast of the earth. Now, in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, I would like to stop here and uh, apostle because I have some arguments. People have been united against the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will see that uh, who made uh, the effort to unite against the Lord Jesus Christ. Chiefs, priests, elders, and all the council. Now the chief priests and the elders. And how many? All the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. So these individuals, they are highly educated in different uh, branches of uh, social branches, and they all unite us. So we are talking about unity. Now, is this the unity of the scripture, brothers and sisters? Or this is the unity of the world? Because we can slide very easily from one side to another side. Now, Pharisees and Sadducees, how many of you have read these Arab Ages and other books? You know, and the scripture, that Pharisees, Pharisees and Sadducees, they were fighting together against each other for a while, yes? And now, in the meeting called in the haste, Pharisees and Sadducees were more nearly united than ever before. So there was a unity. Uh, for those who don't uh, know much about Pharisees and Sadducees, I will give you a quick definition. Uh, uh, the uh, Sadducees were the intellectuals in Israel who loved very much the Greek philosophy. You know, drink now, eat now, enjoy life now, tomorrow we can die, who cares? Leave the moment. That was the mentality. They, 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 that's why they didn't believe in the resurrection, because they want to know that there is no judgment after resurrection. You know, So these were the Sadducees, quickly. Pharisees were a little bit more hypocritical than Sadducees, because they were doing the same uh, scenes like the, like the Sadducees, uh, Pharisees, I'm sorry. Pharisees were a little bit more hypocritical than the Sadducees, because they were doing the same scenes that they were accusing the, uh, the Sadducees uh, in, in, in behind the curtain. So there was no difference in terms of lifestyle. 
between the Sadducees and Pharisees. Where, one, Sadducees, they, they had an intellectual perception about uh, religion. They were doing... Uh, like the world, but Pharisees were coming to church and they were doing the same thing like the Sadducees, you know. So now they are arguing like crazy about the, uh, uh, theology and all of a sudden they get united to crucify and to destroy uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate and Herod became united. You know that Pilate and Herod, they were very uh, uh, terrible enemies. And all of a sudden, when Pilate uh, had Jesus in his hands, he also thought this is a good opportunity to heal an old quarrel between himself and Herod. And he so improved. So what the Spirit of Prophecy says, that two magistrates made friends over the trial of Jesus. It's interesting. So Herod says, man, if I, ki if I catch you, I'm going to kill you. Pilate says, just break the Roman law and I'm going to destroy you. So they were throwing in each other such epithets, such, such, such words. Now all of a sudden, you know, Pilate and Herod became friends in crucifying Jesus Christ. That is the unity of the world, brothers and sisters. In the time of persecution, after Jesus has been ascended in heaven, the world was united to persecute the people of God. And uh, what, is, what is there? Converts to the new faith, I mean the new Christian faith, were rapidly increasing, and both Pharisees and Sadducees agreed that if these new teachers were suffered to go unchecked, their own influence would be in greater danger than when Jesus was upon the earth. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees agreed. So you see, the world can join together to destruction of Christianity. Now, Brothers and sisters, this is the final uh, um, element. Jewish nation and the Romans became united, one nation, based on this statement. John chapter 19, verse 15. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answer, We have no king but Caesar. When the Jewish people made that statement, they became subservants of the Roman Empire. They basically, Jewish nation became one, blended with, 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 the, with, the, with the Roman Empire. Now, I would like to go a little bit farther in that respect. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give it. Brothers and sisters, here is the peace of, uh, that, that is given by God and the peace that comes from the world. So, the peace that comes from God is originated in the Word of God, in the Scripture. The peace of the world is originated in the tradition of man. The peace of God is coming from a relationship with Jesus. The peace of the world comes from relationship with the religious leaders. The peace of God comes comes from the law of God, obedience to, to the commandments through the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. And the uh, peace of the world comes from man's dogma. God's instructions, human teachings, God's way, man's way. This is, in fact, the difference between the peace of Christ and the peace of the world. Now, like Israel, Christians too often yield to the influence of the world and conform to its principles and customs. In order to secure their friendship, meaning unity, of the ungodly, but in the end will be, uh, will be found that these professed friends are the most dangerous of all. Wow. So you, you want to get friend with the, uh, the world? That's suicide, brothers and sisters. If we want to get friendly with the people of this world, that's a, a, a committing suicide. And look at this, that those who try to secure friendship or unity with of ungodly, but the, uh, in the end will be found that these professed friends are the most dangerous of enemies. Now, look at this. That's uh, powerful. Satan works through the ungodly under cover of a pretended, what everybody? Friendship. Wow. So you, you have friends in your circle. It says, leave you. Wow. Look at you. I mean, I don't have my many, many friends, you know, here, there, but uh, hypothetically speaking, somebody comes to me and says, um, I'm friend with Gabi, for instance, okay? And and Gabi, no, I am friend, he's friend with me. And I'm coming to him from the world, okay? So now I'm going to him, and undercover, I am his enemy, but I show myself as a friend. And I said, Gabi, you have such a nice muscle. Man, you look good. Look at your shoes. Where did you get that shoes? Mom, the, the, the jeans, uh, I mean, the, the clothes. I mean, it's amazing. i never seen such a store. So I try to use flattery to gain his trust and confidence, his friendship. That's a trap. That's a danger. And look, the Ellen G. White says, Satan works through the ungodly under cover of pretended friendship to allure God's people into sin, that he may separate them from him and win their defense. What? 
When their defense is removed, then he will lead his agents to turn against them and seek to accomplish their what? Their destruction. Brothers and sisters, friends, young people, seeking friendship with the world is suicide. And um, I tell that to myself and to adults and to elderly, to everybody. Who is behind a, a friendly relationship with the people of the world? Satan, yes? Works through the ungodly undercover or pretended friendship. And at the end, when the defense is refused, what is defense? What is the defense, brothers and sisters? When the Christ, when the Lord Jesus withdraws from that, from your life or my life, we are gone. Says that leads the same agents to turn against them and seek to accomplish their destruction. This is unity with the world, which I find very, 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 very dangerous. Um, when we talk about true unity, now this was the contrast. You remember, first lecture of mine was, and ye shall know good and evil. Unfortunately, we have to study the unity in Christ by contrast with the unity with the world to, to make the things clear. So now we talk about the true unity, brothers and sisters. What is the way out? Uh, what is the, 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 the unity with the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can uh, do that? Now, I want to say that um, the spirit of prophecy has a statement reflecting Christ. He who is at peace with God and his fellow man, meaning who, who is in unity with God. I said in the beginning of my subject that even either you say peace or unity is the same thing. So he who is at peace with God or in unity with God and his fellow man cannot be made, what? Miserable. You know how many years I've been miserable? Have you? I mean, I, many, many years I've been miserable because I, was, I did not have the profound relationship with the Lord Jesus. I was a little bit Sadducee. Sometimes I was a Pharisee. I, I myself, if you would ask me in the good times of mind, what are you in fact? I didn't know to explain theologically, am I a Sadducee or a Pharisee? Until the Lord opens my mind and explains me the scriptures. <laughs> Have you met the Lord Jesus to open your mind and explain scriptures? It's a time of way out. It's the time when the Lord Jesus really, really... I, I remember, brothers and sisters, when uh, uh, at the age of 16, I, I had a little Bible like this size, a pocket Bible. And my father noticed that at 3 o'clock in the night, I mean, I'm talking about 1980, uh, 1986, 1984, 90, somewhere there. So at that time, no videos, no internet, no TV, no nothing. So the only thing that you can do in the night, 3 o'clock in the night, reading something. So my, my father went, went to the bathroom one night, second night, third night, and he saw beneath the door, uh, open door of my, my bedroom, that there is a light on. Three o'clock, what does this guy do? So he didn't bump on me to invade my privacy. Second day in the morning, I went to school. Uh, I was in high school, probably ninth grade or 10th grade. So he went straight to my bedroom. I was hiding my Bible in my blanket. I was rolling my blanket, put it there in a place, and the Bible was rolled in the blanket. I mean, was in the rolled blanket. Imagine, brothers and sisters, my father went straight there. He unrolled the blanket and he found the Bible. He didn't tell me absolutely anything. He knew that I am a different person. I didn't know. I was a youngster, 14, 15, whatever. And he knew that he was talking to my mom. Something is wrong with this guy. He doesn't laugh like before. He's not going with the same friends. You know, when you read the Bible and Jesus is opening your mind, transformations unimaginable occur in your mind, in your heart, without you knowing. I didn't know, not notice, but he did. So he came there, he saw the Bible. Aha! He's moving on with the sectarians, these uh, groups of sect, you know, Romania, 90, or whatever, communists, you know, everything that was Bible-related was uh, sectarian movement and all these crazy things. So he's waiting for me, and when he come, I come home and says, okay, we have a talk. He takes the Bible. Man. And when he smashed the Bible on my head, 
in my house. You have no permission to read scripture or to practice this religion. You give up your Christ or whatever sect, movement, whatever you are going, or you get out of my home. That was my trade. It was right at the entry of our home. You know, I never said no to my parents, and it was really hard for me. My mom was sitting there between me and my father because she was ready to beat me up. And uh, she was crying, and I said, Dad, you know that I never said no to you, but if I have to choose between you and Christ, it never been Christ so dear to my heart like that time. Next Thursday, I have chosen the Lord Jesus, and I left my home. I had just one suit and probably 10 bucks in my, bo- in, in my pocket, and the scripture. This is the way that I left my home. You see, brothers and sisters, to join that sweetness, that beauty of relationship with the Lord Jesus, we must find a way out. Jesus must break the spell of sin in our hearts. And it's not about us, how much we read, how much we know. It's about him opening our mind, touching our hearts to understand the scriptures. And I believe that this is, the, this is the way out for all of us. And uh, before we talk about the greatest unity, the huma- humanity will witness the, the unity of Christianity, we must talk about the greatest separation the universe have ever witnessed. Because universe cannot understand how an evil person, like me and like you, I'm sorry, like you and like me or like us, The the universe cannot understand how an evil person can break the the spell of sin and merge and unite with the Lord Jesus. That's a mystery. A mystery of salvation. Is that true? He who is at peace with God and his fellow man cannot be made miserable. Envy will not be in his heart. Evil surmising will find no room there. Hatred cannot exist. We don't enjoy advertising somebody else's sin. Is that true? When, when, when we have, we are at peace with God, and I said that God is love. Who he, uh, he who is at peace with love. And his fellow man cannot made, be made miserable. Today, I want to leave this place not as a miserable person. Leave all the garbage here. Move out from this church as a free man and woman in Christ. Salvation, grace, forgiveness is right here. Just open your mind. Let Christ get in the heart. And you will have a revolutionized experience when you get out of this door. Your conversation with the people in your family, conversation with your friends, relationship with your, with, with, with your Christ at a table, in your bedroom, in your sphere of labor will be different. Just open your heart, open your mind, and, and there will be an extraordinary experience. We shake hands in 30 minutes from now on, and we are not miserable because we trust the love, we trust God, and we are united with our fellow men. Brothers and sisters, as I said, today we are here not to make comparison between each other. I tell you, we are all the same. You like it or you don't like it. And I am a minister. I merge myself in general common misery. But I have a good news. Jesus can forgive us. We can leave the misery here and we can get his merits, his love, and we change our life. We change. When we have something to say to each other, we will be kind, we will be friendly, we don't advertise what is not supposed to be advertised. And as the Spirit of Prophecy says, when you really want to say something to someone, you must be ready to die for that person before you go to rebuke and you must have tears in your eyes. If I didn't have that experience, brothers and sisters, if I, and Ellen Joyce says, leave you, if you are not ready to die for that person, if you, you, you don't cry in your heart, if you are not ready to fast and pray for that person, don't go to rebuke anybody, because you will do more damage. I learned, and I, I have many, many failures in this respect. Many times I left myself emo- emotional, and I went to rebuke or advise someone in a very unchristian-like manner, and I am deeply sorry. I'm deeply sorry. So today we are here to, to make peace with God, with our fellow man, and then we get out of our misery. Now, 
Whoever by the quiet unconscious influence of the holy life shall reveal the love of Christ, whoever by word or deed shall lead other to renounce sin and yield his heart to God is a what? A peacemaker, meaning that this guy who will lead others to renounce sin is a man who wants unity. Can we say amen to that, brothers and sisters? This is what we want. Those who will lead others to renounce sin and encourage others to break the spell of sin and yield his heart to God is a peacemaker. Then he opened their minds that they might understand the scripture, the great separation that universe imagines. So before the great unity in Christianity, we have to assist to what? The great separation, brothers and sisters, between our aspiration and our intentions. Because um, unity in Christ means unity with his word. Now, think not that I came to send peace on, on earth. I came not to send peace but the sword. Now, as I said, the word of God penetrates your heart and will demolish all your relationship. For I come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against his, her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Matthew 10, 34, which means, for I came to set man in discrepancy or adversity with his father and so on and so forth. And a man's foe or man's enemy shall be day of his own household. So before you talk about unity in Christ, you talk about something very, very, very severe that occurs in my personal lifestyle, in my relationship with my parents, in my relationship with my spouse and my family, my children. Brothers and sisters, standing alone for Jesus, united alone with the Lord Jesus Christ, will demand the cruelest separation. From those that we love. That's, that's the price. You want to pay? I want to pay? We must stand for the Lord. And that will lead us to a terrible, painful separation from those that we love. And the scripture says, And ye shall be hated of how many people? All, uh, and these all people are united or not? They are united in hatred against you and me. So basically, don't try to make efforts to be united. You are united. I am united with you in sin unless I am converted. So, unity as the world does peace. Unity as the world does ma makes unity. It's not without effort. We don't need to make efforts. We are united in sin. But if you really want to be united with the Lord, if I really want to be united with the Lord Jesus, that must be a, 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 a broken relationship between me and, and sin. And this is done by the Lord Jesus because I have no power. I have no power to dismiss myself. Christ will break the power of sin, brothers and sisters. We shall find that we must let loose all... How many hands? We shall find that we must let loose all hands except the hand of Jesus Christ. Friends will prove treasures and will betray us. Who? Who will be that? Friends. Relatives deceived by the enemy will think that they do good service in opposing us and putting forth the utmost efforts to bring us into hard places, hoping we will deny our fate. So this is true separation from the world and merging, holding fast on the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the scripture, now I want to... Uh, bring up a little bit of theology on our subject. In the scripture, we have two places that speaks about a Christian unity. One is in the New Testament, John chapter 17. What chapter, brothers and sisters? John 17, yes? That's a huge display of Christ's prayer, uh, begging for unity of the disciples and Christian uh, church. And the other one that is, has, I mean, because the John chapter 17 in New Testament has a very plain language, very open language. It's, it's, a, it's a narration, basically. Jesus wants unity of, 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 of his disciples, and he's talking to the Father. Now, in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 37, brothers and sisters, we have another, uh, another appeal to unity, to Christian people, if from the prophetical perspective. So, how many places do we have in the Bible regarding the unity of the people of God? One in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 37, and one in New Testament in John chapter 17. Now, let's go to there quickly. 
Uh, neither pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So that's the, 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 the substance of the, the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in John chapter 17. Now, uh, come with me in one of the, the most intriguing revelations uh, in the scripture. By the way, imagine that Ezekiel is in a helicopter. In what, everybody? In a helicopter. And from above, he's flying with the Lord, and down there, he see a valley of dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Brothers and sisters, this is a revelation about unity. You may say, man, Brother Levy is going off uh, the subject. Uh, you see, the vision that Ezekiel has about the unity of Christianity is in the valley, it's not in the top of the mountain. And uh, then it says, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Now, let me, uh, let me clarify and define what is a dry bone in the valley of dry bones. Brothers and sisters, you and me are the dry bones in the valley. Yeah, and I have arguments in the spirit of prophecy. I am a dry bone. By the way, Ellen Why says that we preach the law of God until we got what? Dry. Like the mounts of the Gilboa, yes? So dry, uh, dry bones means that we, have, we are lifeless. We are uh, without love, without compassion. We are coming here making noise. You know, imagine a skeleton comes in the church in Sacramento. It's just bones. Makes click, click. Click, click, you know, no, no harmony. So we are very many. We are very many. And in an open valley means that we are a display for the entire world. The people around us smell the hypocrisy in Brother Livio to the Royal. And in you and me, in all of us. They smell us. The, the open valleys, we are a public display. Everybody knows. that. Look at these guys. They lose two worlds. They go to church. They demand that they are Christians. And when they go home, they are something else. Poor people. You know what? Break it out. Go there. Take your whiskey. Drink and enjoy the world. Because anyway, you don't get salvation. This is what the world says. But the, word say, the Lord says, you come to me if you want to seize your misery. And, and we are dry bones, very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. If somebody will come, will ask you, Brother, do you think that the bones in your Sacramento church will, will be alive? Can they, can they resurrect? Lord, you know. It's like the question that uh, has been addressed to Nathaniel. says, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Do you want to come and see if the dry bones can resurrect? Uh, we, we go farther. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause. Who does the resurrection of people in our church? Who does the resurrection of the dry bones? Myself? Can I resurrect myself? No. I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Brothers and sisters, if you are a bone today, you have a chance. I have a chance to resurrect. If you think that you are alive, God bless. God doesn't talk to people that are alive here. He talks with the people that are dry bones. And look what the Lord says. And I will lay sinus upon you. I will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Only when God makes the resurrection of our life and transforms us from uh, dry bones in uh, people alive, only then we are willing and ready to understand who is what? Who is the Lord? We don't know the Lord unless we are resurrected. So I prophesied that I was commanded. As I was prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together. All the people in Sacramento Church, all the bones. I'm a bone. Brother George is a bone. Gabby is a bone. This brother is a bone. This sister is another bone. We all come what? 
together. But do you think that I can come close to Brother Vasile and Vasile close to me? No, we can. I cannot move. I'm a bone. He cannot move. You cannot move. We cannot. We are scattered in an open valley. Who makes us to come closer to each other, brothers and sisters? God. If we read the Bible that we cannot save ourselves and there is something that God does first and then we acknowledge then Jesus is opening our mind and understand and behold a shaking we talk about shaking do you know what shaking in prophecies what is the shaking before the, out, uh, the loud cry before the letter rain there is what a great shaking and now it says and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his Bone. And the spirit of prophecy, uh, the Bible says, And when I beheld, lo, the sinus and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus said the Lord God, Come from the four winds. Who is the, who is the, God is talking to the wind? Do you really believe? Or he talks with the Holy Spirit. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied it, I commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up, and their feet, an exceeding great army. Amen. This is what you and me can be, brothers and sisters. That's the unity made by God, not by the world. That's the unity when we start to, 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 to come closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be pitiful, to be compassionate, to pray for, for wounds that sin has created in me and in you. When instead of accusing, we pray and pray and fast. And if we really have to rebuke, then we do it. Force is the last resort Jesus applied in his missionary work. An exceeding great army. This is the people of God at the end of the time, brothers and sisters. This is the people of God. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Meaning the Sacramento church, all the people of God worldwide at this time. Our bones are dry. Behold, they say, we are saying in our hearts, our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. How many of you went in the times in life, brothers and sisters, when you lost hope that you will ever be saved? Have you ever reached the ground zero, meaning the valley? I did. I don't ask you for propaganda, raise hands, do things. No. But personally, there were many instances when I have been confronted with myself. And let me tell you something. When the enemy of God comes against you, he knows to make such a picture of yourself that you are disgusted of who you are. And then when he tells you the truth about you and about me, he's looking to you with an air of arrogance and safe security. Now tell me, leave you, how can a miserable like you be safe? Tell me. And you just stay there. And I said, there is no hope for me. Have you experienced meeting with the enemy? Have you personally? Describing who you are, in fact, no one here can describe you or me as the enemy of the souls can do. And the Lord says, if you lost hope today here, that you can be one with me, if you lost hope today, that you can be one with each other, don't say it. Don't say, behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore, prophesy and say unto those discouraged people in Sacramento Church, that thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out, up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. So if you are without hope today, right now, this is the Lord, the Lord's message for you. It's a message of love. Just hold on. Remove the hand from the hands of your pretended friends. And hold on unto the Lord Jesus. And you will see great things. You don't leave this church miserable, brothers and sisters. And he shall put my spirit in you, and he shall live, says the Lord. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall come 
one. Uh, I don't know exactly, do you know, brothers and sisters, what is the tiniest cell of our body? We have trillions and trillions of cells in our body. The tiniest micro cell they discovered is called limonin and has this, the form of a cross. Do you see that? That's a micro picture. It's the form of a cell. And the science is amazed with the fact that this microcell called limonin is, f in fact, the glue that keeps the entire body together. This cell, microcell, has the form of the cross, is the tiniest element, the tiniest microcell in our body. And that keeps united each of those trillions of cells in our body. Who keeps us united today, brothers and sisters? The cross. The cross of Christ. He is the one that, that gives you power to understand the, the, the passion of salvation. Satan works to make the, the prayer of Christ of non-effect. He makes continual efforts to create bitterness and discord. For where there is unity, there is what, everybody? There is strength. And one is with all the powers of hell cannot break. All who shall aid the enemies of God by bringing weaken, uh, weakness and sorrow and discouragement upon any of God's people to their own perverse ways and tempers are working directly against the prayer of Christ. There is nothing that Satan fears more much as the that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out His Spirit and a languishing church and an impenitent congreg congregation. I thought that the, the Holy Spirit will uh, be uh, poured upon a perfect uh, super saint uh, church. W w do you understand this message, brothers? Should I read it again? Because it's a, it's a very, very powerful statement. It says, clear the way by removing any hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an in impenitent congregation. We have to remove all these uh, things, sins that are covered, sins that are known. Sometimes we make fun of people. Uh, you know, I saw you sinning in TV, but you didn't see, see me sinning somewhere else. Brothers and sisters, there is no point. We, 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 we must stop to be little children. We all are born sin. When I wake up in the morning, I wake up guilty. Do you know why? Because my grand-grand-grandfather signed a treaty with the enemy of the souls and sold me out to slavery of sin. The only one who can save us when you wake up in the morning and you wake up guilty Talk to Jesus. Hold on his hand. Don't talk to Jesus like, uh, like poetry. You have a, uh, did, you, did you hear people uh, saying the same uh, prayer all on and on and on? I, I heard people that are coming all the time with poetry to Jesus. Jesus doesn't need poetry. He needs few words, few tears, a trembled and humble heart, and he's listening to you. Jesus loves sinners. In fact, he was on the cross because he assumed the risk to be the friend of the sinners. Is that true? Yes or no? When you come out of this church, I have to be very careful with whom I am talking to, you know, because I have to talk only with the people that are not sinners. Unfortunately, I don't have anybody because all of us are sinners, including myself. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would be removed, uh, would remove the most difficulties. Angels have been grieved and God displeased by the hours which we have been spent in justifying what? Self. If we quit that, if we quit pride, in how many minutes we can make unity amongst each other, brothers and sisters? Five minutes. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would remove most of the difficulties. God designs that his children shall be one. If this unity did, not, did but exit, it would speak to the, the world of the power of God manifested in his children. Christ has said, But this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have loved one another, if this unity exists, we should bear to the world our divine credentials. Christ would be represented by his children. It is a fatal mistake to think that there is nothing to do in obtaining salvation. You are to cooperate with the agencies of heaven. There is a cross to be lifted in the pathway, a wall to be scaled before you enter in the internal city, a ladder to be climbed before the gate of pearls is reached. And as you realize your inability to climb the ladder, 
to go over the wall, yes? Cry for help. A divine voice will come to you from the bottomless of, he of heaven saying, Take hold of my strength. I remember I was in Brazil uh, three months ago. And uh, here is a man that I know. He's a composer. He composed uh, the music uh, for the, the words. It's a, there is a song, the history of Reformation is just in, 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 in Europe. It's a beautiful music, uh, uh, musical item. So he wrote the, uh, the, 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 the music for that song. So he came to Brazil. He was a very active person. And uh, all of a sudden, I met with him in the airport. He was skinny. He was burly walking. And I said, what are you doing here? And he tells me the story. You know what? I, I have hepatitis C, multiple uh, cirrhosis. Basically, they diagno diagnosed me with a terminal cancer. The esophagus, it's so expanded that I, I am one second away of explosion or of internal bleeding, and that will be fatal for me. The doctor advised me not to come in Brazil, uh, not to fly, because I can die on the plane. So, but I took, I grasped my last drop of faith, and I came here because I heard that we have a sanatorium in Brazil. And uh, he spent most of the time for that musical congress that was there. And I saw him many times single out, alone, eating. And we had our own fun, you know, friends talking together. And I was fasting in Sabbath morning, and I went to the kitchen, and I saw him alone there, trying to eat some fruits, barely surviving. And I said, Lord, give me some power to go to encourage these men. I went there, and I authored his name, and I said, how are you doing? And through tears, he was trying to eat some cereal. He says, man, I'm sad. I met with the brethren, the doctors in Kurichiba, and when they saw my, my, uh, my uh, tests, my diagnostic says, listen, we, this is a federal regulation, we cannot put you in the hospital, you can die anytime. So they didn't tell him that you can die anytime, but he's a high risk and about due to the federal regulations, we do not have permission to receive you, so you have to go back home. The man was absolutely discouraged. And I tried to tell him, I said, you know, brother, it doesn't matter if you are alive or you are dead, you are not dead. Christ has your life. What is your relationship? So I was trying to encourage him. I, I, I left the group and I was talking to him. And all of a sudden, beside when I, I tried to explain him, another brother comes, it's Brother Cruz. So Brother Cruz tells me, Brother Livio, would you be so kind to translate for him? Because now the doctors told me, listen, you speak the same language like him, so you must tell him the reality. He is dying. I said, uh, Brother Mat Sousa, how can I tell him that he's dying? Well, you find a nice language. I said, that there is no li not nice language to tell someone you are dying. Well, well, do you find a nice language to tell someone that you are dying? However, you must tell him that he will not be received and you have to go back home. And you don't know if he will make it. So as I was bumbling my words there, stumbling myself in my ideas how to approach him and crying with him, Brother Cruz comes there. And he says, Brother Livio, now you translate for me. So he says, Brother, there was a man coming to our sanatorium. He was a lawyer some years ago, Brother Mateo Souza told him. And he was diagnosed with cirrhosis, final terminal cancer, you're going to die. He took a lot of chemotherapy. He was no hair, no nothing, skinny, bones of skin. One of the bones of the Dry Valley, brothers and sisters. And uh, he says, every day in the morning, he was knocking to the door of Brother uh, Mateus uh, Sousa, the doctor from Curitiba. How many chances do I have? Every day in the morning, how many chances do I have? How many? The, the lawyer, the, the, the guy, the sick person that was in the sanatorium was knocking to the door and addressing one single question. How many chances do I have? I am a dry bone. Look at me. I'm just skinny bones. And every day after one time, the doctor says, Lord, I must pray. So Brother Mat uh, Sousa uh, kneels down in his office and says, Lord, tell me what to tell this poor man. 
And exactly when he said what to tell to this poor man, the guy is knocking to the door. Poof, opening the door. Doctor, tell me how many chances I have to recover. And the brother is standing up and is looking to the man that was like a mommy. I don't know exactly if you saw people that have um, terminal cancer with cirrhosis. The, the liver shuts down, pancreas, everything. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. And, and the, the man in Brother Cruz is telling the story via, uh, I mean, Brother Mateo uh, Sousa is telling the story via Brother Cruz. And Brother Cruz says, uh, Brother uh, Sousa, the doctor says, listen, sir, go home and pray to Jesus. There was a grave. And in the grave was a man called Lazarus. And God, you can remove the stone away. And Jesus can perform a resurrection. So that was, your answer. That was his doctor's answer to him. To a man that has lost hope. He goes home. After six years, brothers and sisters, uh, another two people come back to, the, to, to Kurichiba. And he says, do you remember me, Mr. Salsa? The guy says, no, I don't remember you. He says, I am the one that six years ago was diagnosed with cirrhosis. He says, hey, what did you do? You're supposed to be dead. And he starts to cry and says, I did as you told me. Every day in the morning, I removed the stone. And I asked Jesus to resurrect Lazarus. At that very time, I broke in tears because Brother Cruz came there to encourage these men, but encourage me. Because that experience was for me. Every day, I was spending nights in prayer with the Lord to remove the stone and resurrect Lazarus. Brothers and sisters, if you are a dry bone today, you have one thing. Just remove the stone, kneel down, and talk to Jesus, and he can resurrect you, take you out of that grave. My grave has 3,000 square feet and five bedrooms, yet stinks is still a grave. I don't know how big your grave is. If you have swimming pool, airplane, or what, I don't care. It's a grave. Every day in the morning, that man stood up and says, Jesus, I removed the stone. Now you do the resurrection. Jesus will not remove the stone. He will tell us to remove the stone. He will give us power to remove the stone. But he will do the resurrection. We are all bonds, and we want unity with unity in love, in Christ. And he promised, we have the evidences, that he can join these bonds together and resurrect us from our bonds. There was a statement, and I, this is my final, I promise. But you go and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call righteous, righteous but sinners to repentance. You know, this has a practical application. When Jesus told some people, go and, and, go and, 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 and find what mercy is. But brother, Jesus is the source that teaches us what mercy is and sacrifice, yes? Before a great king of the world, Solomon, there were two women. Do you remember that? And both women demanded a little child. And one says, let the child be cut in two. The other one says, no, 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 Solomon, mighty king, give the child to him. Now, one demanded sacrifice. Cut the child. I demand sacrifice. I demand justice. The other one says, I demand mercy. Take my child and give it to, the, to, to, to her. You see, when we, we, we talk about two elements here. I'm sorry. We talk about two elements here. We talk about mercy. The woman that gave up her child for the sake of saving the life. She was begging for mercy, and she was an honest person. Usually, people who are demanding cut the head, they have some problems in their life personally. But go ye and learn what the minute I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I'm not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. My uh, wish and prayer for today is that every day in the morning we can come is dry bones to the Lord Jesus, and he can make that extraordinary resurrection. And somehow, if we don't find Jesus, let us go to him. He will teach us what mercy is and no sacrifice. May the Lord help us. Amen.